forgot to start. Okay. So, again, three conditions of continuity. Again, intuitively, can you draw the graph without lifting your pen from the paper? What does it mean? How do we pin that down rigorously? There's the three conditions, right? F is defined, the limit exists, and they're equal. If any of these three conditions fails, then the function is said to be discontinuous at the point A. And if we collect all the points at which the function is continuous, we call that the interval of continuity. Um, and from what we've already learned in particular, right, we already mentioned the fact on the quiz, the quiz question, for polynomial functions and for rational functions, the limit value and the function value are the same wherever they're defined. So those functions are continuous everywhere they're defined. Um, so, for example, what kind of function is the function in uh, example one here, the first one, part A? What kind of function is that? It's a polynomial function. It is a combination of integral, positive integral powers of the variable. There's no negative powers, so there's no fractions, uh, no fractional powers, integral powers, and coefficients, combinations through addition and subtraction. So this is a polynomial function. So it is continuous everywhere because of this. First of all, it's defined everywhere, and everywhere is defined. The limit and the function value are the same. And so its interval of continuity would be the entire real number line from negative infinity to positive infinity. That's automatic. Now I know I don't even have to look at the graph. All I've got to do is verify that condition, which we've already verified, and I know. Functions of this type, all of them are continuous. Uh, what type of function is this? It's a rational function. Rational in the sense of ratio. It's a ratio of polynomials. That's what a rational function is. It's a numerator and denominator where each part is a polynomial. So this is a rational function. So this function will be continuous everywhere that the function is defined. Is this function defined everywhere? Where is it not defined? One. It's defined everywhere that the denominator is not equal to zero. Uh, but uh, x minus 1 is equal to 0 when x equals 1. So f is not defined uh, at x equals 1. According to the rule, these functions are continuous everywhere they're defined. So they're continuous everywhere except that one point. On the number line, this function is continuous everywhere except this one point, 1. That's where the denominator goes to zero. I don't care about the numerator. That's not a problem. It's just the denominator I have to look at. So if I were to look at the interval over which this function is continuous, it would include everything to the left of one and to the right of one. So I had to toss out that one point where the denominator went to zero and the function is not defined. Everywhere else, it's continuous. So how do I represent the interval of continuity? in our interval form. The left hand interval up to one. Curvy bracket around the one to show it's not being included. And then the union of that set with the set. So this function has an interval of continuity that includes all real numbers except for the number one. There's the way that we express that in interval form. Negative infinity up to one, curvy bracket, union, curvy bracket, one to infinity. Uh, so that's automatic. Anytime I see these two types of functions, continuity issues are already settled. If it's a, ra it's a polynomial, everything's going to work. If it's a rational function, I have to look at that denominator. If the denominator goes to zero, that's a, po that's a point where the function is not defined. The function is not defined, can't be continuous. Okay, um, if a function is not continuous, there's three different ways in which we can categorize the breakdown. And we've seen all of these already. We've seen these, uh, we understand what's involved, at least limit behavior. 
uh, in these three examples, um, the infinite limit. The infinite limit corresponds to asymptotes in the graph. Um, we've got a function that is either rising or falling without bound as we approach the limit point. So infinite limits have that property and uh, that's one way the continuity can break down. Uh, jump is continuity, right? That's a gap. Anytime I've got a function that uh, has a branch that stops at one point, new branch takes up at a different point, got a gap there, that's a discontinuity. We call that the jump case. Um, and again, we've called that the gap problem. And then, uh, oh, and of course, well, each one of these, uh, and so that's the case where the limit fails to exist. The limit fails to exist, but it's not infinite. So how can that happen? Well, that's the only way left that we have. Uh, if the limit is infinite, that's one way that it fails to exist. Other than that, the only other way is through the divergence of the left and right limits. So the jump discontinuity is the case where the limit fails to exist. And finally, the removable case, what we've called the hole problem, a hole punched into the graph. We call this the removable case because the limit does exist, but it deviates from the function value. We could remove it by just taking this point and plugging it back into the hole. Now we could plug that hole up very simply just by relocating that point where it should be. So that's the removable case. We've already seen all three of these, the asymptote case, the infinite behavior, gaps, that's where we had the jump, and then the hole, that's the um, removable case. So there we go. We've already ran, we ran through all these properties associated with these functions earlier, um, but now we can give them names. These are all properties where continuity fails for one of these three reasons. Either the limit is infinite, in which case it doesn't exist. The um, left and right limits don't match up, in which case it fails to exist. Or the removable case, where the limit exists, but it's not equal to the function value. That can happen. Possible the limit exists not equal to the function value. Okay, so let's do that. Here's a function. What kind of function is this? It's a rational function. It's a ratio of uh, two polynomials. Where is this function not continuous? That's the, we'll go ahead. Uh, where are the points where this function fails to be continuous? Two and negative two, right? The problem is we can't let x minus four end up being equal to zero. So for that to happen, that means we can't let x be four. And according to our uh, square root law, uh, there's two possible outcomes here. X can't be equal x can't be equal to plus or minus 2. So those are the points where the function is discontinuous. Okay. So that's, that's easy to check. All I've got to do is look at the function. The denominator is a tip-off. Where does it go to zero? Two places. Now the question is, what kind of discontinuity would we find at these two locations? Um, so, I don't know, let's start with uh, the first one. X equals 2. How do I go about the process of identifying the type of discontinuity that I'll find at this point? The limit. What can I say about the limit as X approaches 2 of this function? What's the limit for? If I do a direct substitution, what do I get? 4 over 0. So here's the limit form. By direct substitution, what kind of limit form is this? What? What is this? Not zero in the numerator, zero in the denominator. What happens here? Limit fails, the limit doesn't exist, but when I go back and look at our three possible 
types of discontinuities? Which one do I immediately identify from this form? Infinite. It's the infinite case. Anytime you're forced to divide by zero into a number that is not itself zero, that's the infinite case. That's it. That's all I have to observe. So this is going to be an infinite discontinuity. Not only is this the limit form, this is the infinite limit form. We did that last time. So what do I know about the graph of this function at the point where x is 2? What am I going to see? I'm going to see an asymptote. So there's a lot of information uh, about this function. It's got an infinite discontinuity at 2. And that means that the graph has a vertical asymptote. So the first discontinuity is infinite. Okay, now let's go to the second case. What happens at x equals negative 2? Okay, so what can I say about the limit? 0 over 0. What do we call that? Indeterminate. This is the indeterminate case. Okay, what can I conclude about the limit from that? Nothing. Maybe it exists, maybe it doesn't. We have to look at it more carefully. So, uh, further investigation is required for the indeterminate form. The infinite form, I'm done. Once I see that numerator not being zero, but the denominator going to zero, I'm done. But in this case, I've got to look at this more carefully. So what can I say about the limit as x approaches minus 2 of this particular type of expression? So uh, the limit is indeterminate. I get 0 over 0. So what's the trick here? Factor, right? The numerator uh, is not, uh, the denominator is factorable. How does it factor? And now I can see why this turned out to be indeterminate. It's because the numerator and denominator shared a common factor, and that common factor itself was going to zero. But under the assumption that x does not actually equal negative 2, which is the assumption of the limit, I can simplify. And now these two expressions are the same. And now, now, what is this limit equal to? So now I can do a direct substitution. Okay. So the most important result here, the limit exists. So, what kind of discontinuity is this? The limit exists, but it's not equal to the function value. In fact, function's not even defined. So, it can't be equal to anything. This is a removable case. Of the three cases, the only one where the limit will actually exist is the removable case. And the other two, the infinite or the gap, the limit fails. So at x equals minus 2, this graph has a removable discontinuity. So what am I going to see if I look at this graph? What would I see at the point where x is negative 2? Hole. See a hole punched in it. So there's two graphic features that I can identify immediately with respect to these discontinuities just because of the nature of, uh, nature of those discontinuities. 
I know this graph has an asymptote at x equals 2 because I got the infinite limit form. I know this graph has a hole punched in it at x equals minus 2 because the indeterminate form led me to the result. Okay, so here's a function that had two discontinuities, but each one was a different type. The infinite discontinuity from the infinite limit form and the uh, removable discontinuity where I was able to establish the existence of the limit even though the function itself didn't have a definition at the given point. Okay, what about this one? And I, you know, I don't think it's going to be hard to figure out what's happening here. Um, it's one of our branch functions. The question is, is this function continuous? If it's not continuous, where would that have to happen? It's got to be a 1. Separately, these are both polynomials. So x squared is a polynomial function, so it's continuous everywhere. 1 minus x is a polynomial function, so it's continuous everywhere. If there is a problem here, it has to be a 1. Right? So, um, uh, right away, that's all I've got to test. What I need to test now is the limit of this function as x approaches 1. So, uh, eh, I don't know if I'm, I, I'll write all that out when I post the notes. I don't want to write all that now. I just said it. So, uh, let's test the limit of this function at the point where x is 1. Um, now, in this case, of course, I know there's a transition at the point 1. I'm moving from one branch to another, from one formula to another. The issue is what's going to happen from the two directions. So uh, let's take the limit as x approaches 1 from the left-hand side of f of x. So if I'm approaching left, uh, 1 from the left-hand side, which branch am I on? Hmm? Top. Or the square band. So if x is approaching 1 from the left, that means x is less than 1, so that puts me on the top branch. So really, I'm asking this. What's the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of the function x squared? What is that equal? 1. I can do a direct substitution, no problem. So the limit from the left-hand side is equal to 1. What's happening from the right-hand side? Now which branch am I on? Right? If I'm to the right of 1, x is bigger. Now I'm down on the lower branch. So this can be rewritten now. As long as I'm to the right of 1, I'm, approach, I'm using this formula. What's that limit equal to? 0. Once again, once I decided which branch I was on, all I had to do was do the direct substitution. Independently, the two branches were continuous at all locations, so their function value and limit value were the same. Okay, so what do you say? What about the limit as x approaches 1? of f of x, what's the conclusion? Does not, Does not exist. Why not? Why not? Left and right are not the same. From the left I got 1, from the right I got 0. Those two things are different, so the limit fails. In fact, now I can draw a picture of what this looks like. Um, let's see. Uh, so the branch for the square function uh, at one. So starting from uh, so starting from the left, I've got the parabola up to here, open circle because the lower that branch doesn't include the endpoint, and then the transition. Uh, that's the line that starts here, like so, and goes down in that direction. So, what type of discontinuity is this? Jump. And that's the basic way, you know, I can't, you know, it's, uh, beyond the branch functions, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, you know, uh, now there are some functions that can be defined in such a way that they naturally have gaps in them. 
Um, but aside, but it, even those functions, uh, there's a the step function where you round to the nearest integer, right? That step function naturally has gaps in it, but it can be expressed as a branch. It's a branch function in disguise. Uh, you know, these jump discontinuities are basically always the result of these branch functions uh, having this uh, gap where one branch takes up, the next branch now is shifted. So um, the limit fails to exist, and that means it's got to be one of these two. It's got to be either, now, but it's not infinite. Like, that's the idea. Uh, it, it's not either of these two cases can't be removable because that case has a limit existing. So it's this case. The limit fails because left and right don't match up. So this function has a jump discontinuity. Uh, at the point where x is equal to 1. Continuous everywhere else, just there. Um, and Ah, here's, a, here's an interesting one. Uh, here's an interesting function. And this is, uh, this is kind of what I was just talking about. Now here's a function that's represented by a simple formula. X divided by its absolute value. Is this function continuous? And if it's not, what kind of discontinuity is it? Okay, okay so uh, absolute values being used here. X in the numerator, absolute value in the denominator. Uh, this isn't, this is kind of rational, this expresses a ratio, but it's not a ratio of polynomials. The absolute value function is not a polynomial. But still, where is this function going to be? Does, if, there, if this function does have a discontinuity, where does it have to be? Zero, for the usual reason. Uh, this function is not defined at zero. So, I know this function is discontinuous there. The question is, what kind of discontinuity is it? Now, of course, we've already seen an example. In fact, the typical example here, when the denominator goes to zero, is the asymptote. That's usually what we see, uh, for, especially for rational functions. Anytime we identify this type of discontinuity where we've got the denominator going to zero, that's typically the result of the asymptotic behavior, the asymptote. Is that what's happening here? Well, what, uh, so I know it's discontinuous. What's the limit form though? Let's, let's go ahead and check the limit form. So now what I want to do is look at this. The limit as x approaches zero of this. What's the limit form? It's indeterminate. Zero over zero. So this is no, does not look like the case of the um, of the um, asymptote. This isn't infinite. Well, maybe this is more like the removable case. We already saw that, right? Here was where we saw the removable case. We got the indeterminate form from the denominator and the numerator going to zero at the same time. So, maybe that's the case. Well, in order to establish that, we're going to have to look at um, this, the limit more carefully. And of course, the problem now is the absolute value kind of messes everything up. Uh, there's no factorization here that I can see. Um, the numerator and the denominator are very close to one another. They're almost the same, but I've got the issue of what, how does the absolute value interact with uh, the uh, possible valuations of this fraction. So let's look at the two limits from left and right. What do I know about the, so I'm coming from the left hand side, x is coming from the left. What kind of numbers are I using when I'm to the left of zero? Negative. negative. So x is approaching from the left, so that means that x is negative. What do we know about the absolute value of negative numbers? They're positive. How do I make a negative number positive? Knowing that x is negative, how can I rewrite the absolute value without the bars?
What? If I know x is negative, how do I force it to be a positive number? Oh, I don't want to square it. That changes its value. How do I t turn positives into negatives? Apply negation. That's what we're doing. Right? When we're trying to take the absolute value of a negative number, essentially what we're doing is we're applying the negative to it. Applying a negative to a negative number forces it to be positive. So if I'm to the left of zero, then the absolute value of x is equal to its opposite. Okay, so knowing that, that did, now this is something I can work with. Knowing that I start with a negative number, knowing what absolute value does to a number, now I have an expression that can be simplified. Under the assumption that x is not equal to zero, how do I simplify this expression? Okay, negative one. Right? Assume, assuming x is not itself zero, then this fraction is just x divided by its opposite. So this would be equal to negative one. In fact, now I know something about this graph. This graph is always equal to negative one when I'm to the left of zero. Okay, uh, suppose I approach this point from the right. Now what kind of numbers is x going to be? Positive. What do we know about the absolute value of a positive number? It's equal to itself, right? The absolute value doesn't change positive numbers at all. If I start with a positive number, then the absolute value is equal to itself. That's the difference. On the left-hand side, the absolute value does one, uh, or to negatives, Left is zero, the negative numbers, it does one thing. To the right is zero, for the positive numbers, it does something else. Assuming x is not zero, how does that simplify? One. Okay, so what do I say about the limit as x approaches zero as a whole? Doesn't exist. Same reason. Left and right. Not the same. So, what kind of discontinuity is this? Got three choices. Infinite, jump, dis removable. Which one is this? Jump. The limit failed to exist. The removable case is when the limit does exist. This limit failed. So, this function has a jump discontinuity. at x equals zero. It's a branch function in disguise. Right? Now, in fact, now I know exactly what this looks like. Uh, this function uh, over here on the left-hand side is always equal to negative one until I get to zero. It's undefined at zero, but once I transition through that point, it becomes positive one. So that's what this function looks like. If I understand how the absolute value operator works and what it does to the two types of numbers, then it's pretty obvious why this came about. And so there it is. There's a big gap when I cross the transition point. So here's an example of a function that has a uh, uh, jump discontinuity, but it's not ex presented as a branch function. It doesn't literally explain, uh, describe itself through branches. It uses a formula. So it is possible to encounter a, get, a jump discontinuity uh, without having to verify the behavior of the branches directly. Uh, in fact, I had to recreate those branches through my understanding of the operations that are involved here. Uh, and once I had done that, I was able to determine exactly how this function behaved at the transition point. Um, okay. So there's continuity. Uh, that's what I want to uh, be able to identify when a function is not continuous and be able to identify what type of discontinuity any given function has. And all of that depends on these three definitions. The uh, infinite discontinuity when the limit is infinite. The jump, dis the gap dis or jump discontinuity when the left and right limits fail to match up. And the removal discontinuity when the limit exists but deviates from the function value. Those are the three ways that functions 
can fail to be continuous. And there's the uh, mathematical test for continuity beyond that simple intuitive idea of drawing pictures without lifting your pen. Okay, uh, it's a good place to take a break. So, um, give me 10 minutes, 4.31, come back, and we'll move on to the next thing.